scatter your sorrow to the heartless sea. I won't see you in his ashes. You're all diamonds. This man acted as accomplice to the attack on Mother Base. Why are you here? Revenge against the boss. I'm not like you! I think it is time you knew. I'll go alone. Boss, what are you... We can't afford to lose anyone else. What if she's a spy? What if I'm a spy? Are you? Kill him! Kill what should we do, boss? Just give the order. You were right. He is not one of us. Boss. Snake? I did not know there was going to be an episode 2. This is awesome. There's so much more to go then. Sweet. Attention! Diamond Dogs. Even with Skullface dead, our brothers are unavenged. And the phantom pain he brought us lives on. Cypher is still out there. We know they've planted spies. Parasites among us. Watch the man to your left. To your right. Assume nothing. Report everything. It's the only way to protect ourselves. From here on out. right here in our midst and they will get no mercy I didn't even know he was blind Even with Skullface dead, our pain is still right with us. We need... We need more strength. We need more men. Diamond Dogs needs to be bigger. Missions have come in too. We still have a long road ahead of us. Wow! These, there's really... This sign was not here. They are really concerned about spies. Wow, there's signs everywhere! What the hell? You know, I'll be turning diamond dogs against each other is doing this. It's cleaning this blood off us. Wow, big boss is watching. There's even a smaller version next to this shower. I did find this out earlier. But this sign is actually probably the best sign of them all. Uh, don't let me do it. The under construction sign. Hopefully it'll do it. I don't know if it will. Yep. Yep. Welcome back. You're a spy! <laughs> Called it. Okay. Right. What do we got? What do we got? Let's grab my rewards real quick. Okay, we got quite a few cassette tapes. Let's, let's go over those real quick. Ten cassette tapes. Nine cassette tapes. didn't go with depleted uranium for Sahelanthropus's armor because of its strength. He had nukes in mind. Exactly. It's meant to use its body as the fuel component for a nuclear weapon. Sahelanthropus uses built-in uranium enrichment Archaea to melt its own body and extract uranium-235 from the depleted uranium in its armor. Those Archaea perform the enrichment in an extremely short time. The concentration jumps by a factor of several hundred, from 0.2% to over 90%. The end result being highly enriched weapons grade uranium. Sahelanthropus's body itself becomes a nuclear bomb. Emmerich says if it were to self-destruct, the nuclear yield would be somewhere in the region of 15 kilotons. 
Since you need about 50 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to trigger a nuclear reaction, that would mean Sahelanthropus contains something like 23 tons of depleted uranium. That's not very much. No, it isn't. That's about what you'd expect to find in a main battle tank's armor. The point is, it can be transported anywhere, even use its conventional weaponry on the battlefield, and the international community will never suspect a thing. I just received word from the R&D team and the transport team out of Afghanistan. They finished installing Sahelanthropus on the base. It's ours now. All right. Don't let any of the staff touch that thing. Especially Emmerich. Of course. That guy's crush on Sahelanthropus is beyond a joke. Guess he really wants to see his tech stand on its own two legs this time. That's not gonna happen. I know it. So you've got no plans to make it operational again? Damn right. Boss, I want to hear it straight from you. Hear what? What the hell do you want with that thing? The drive is busted. It's not like it has a nuke on board. Even if the metallic archaea could turn it into a nuclear weapon, all it can do is self-destruct. Cephalanthropus just isn't a weapon anymore. It'll draw unwanted attention without even being a deterrent. I know. The weapon's development strut sank two feet under that thing's weight. That's one year's drop in a single night. We've started on reinforcing the strut, but there's no guarantee it'll hold up if a storm hits. I know that, too. Boss, why keep it? It's a mark. Uh, us diamond dogs, we don't have a country to call home. That means we have no past, nothing to prove that we lived. Every one of us threw it all away when we came here. Sahelanthropus is a symbol to show that the likes of us brought at least one crisis to its end. A mark in history. So we can't just fade away. It's of no practical use to us. But we still need it. A symbol of what we've done. I'm glad I sounded you out on this. Snake, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you. I don't need gratitude. I need security. Keep Emmerich away from that thing. Roger that. I'll move back. I got the uh, NPC's dialogue caught up in that. You said that the nuke skull face was trying to spread around the world were equipped with a failsafe. Something that could shut them down at will. His will. Quite so. After all, he needed a guarantee that a fire wouldn't simply turn the weapons back on him. So how can they be stopped? The criticality trigger, that is, the detonator, is a complete black box design. Any attempt to dismantle it causes it to melt in seconds, using the corroding archaea. The design ensures that no detonation is possible unless it disengages the lock. So he had a way to disengage it remotely. Precisely. The client simply presses a button. At that moment, the detonator begins transmission with a surveillance satellite. The satellite reports to him how the client is trying to use the nuke. If he does not object, the lock is disengaged. But if it's a risk to him in any way... The detonator melts down. The same is true if detonation does not occur within a preset time after the lock is disengaged. The nuke is rendered useless. Who the hell would buy something with strings attached like that? The client would never know until the moment they actually tried to use it. Most likely, he would have explained the time delay as the detonators needing time to activate. And he only intended to sell to technologically primitive groups in the first place. Let me guess. He claimed it was defective and offer a replacement. Shadier than a used car salesman. Skullface shakes your hand like a friend, using the other to control you like a puppet. This is how he works. Code Talker, I haven't seen you eat a single thing since you got here. Let me guess, photosynthesis? Oh, what makes you say that? 
Well, a long time ago, I knew someone with a similar ability. Well, you are correct. Most of my body is covered by parasites. I supply them with water, and in return, I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. Uh -huh. It isn't just my skin either. The parasites also act as my eyes. They have replaced many of my internal organs as well. It is thanks to them that I live on after over a century. How did you obtain them anyway? Through your research? I would like to say as much, but there is more to it than that. Let me take you back 20 years. I had hit a dead end with my parasite research. Then I was approached by a foundation. They said they had a sample of an unusual strain of parasite. Which foundation? Apparently, they had links to ARPA. But that is all I learned. I was somewhat ignorant of the ways of the world. Just being able to study it was enough for me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Go on. Half in doubt, I visited them to discover the body of an old man. Well, to be precise, his partial remains. A collection of parts, you could say. The man had died in an explosion. An old man, you say? His flesh had not decomposed. In fact, the tissue's cells were still metabolizing. The parasite had infected, or should I say assimilated with, the tissues and was keeping them alive. I became obsessed with studying the body parts, foregoing food and even sleep. Every day was filled with new discoveries. The parasite's biology, internal anatomy, life cycle. But there was only so much I could learn through observation. And so I made a decision to truly know the parasites. I had to live with them. So you implanted them inside you from the dead man's flesh? Correct. <sighs> it was quite a gamble whether or not they would adapt to me. But fortunately, it appears I was compatible with them. Or perhaps, through my many years of research, my immune system learned to tolerate them. Were they that body's only parasite? Yes. However, there was a separate specimen that supplied its host with adrenaline in response to pain. And yet another that could control insects at will through secreting heterogeneous pheromones. I wanted exposure to them, to take them into me. But my wishes were denied. Their records, though, provided clues that helped advance my research. Would you care to join me? A life spent never worrying about food is a most wonderful one. I think I'll pass, but thanks. This has been helpful. Skullface has finally burned out. The world is rid of his existence at last. Was he still alive? You could say that. But you could also say he'd been dead for decades. What's that supposed to mean? Biologically speaking, it's hard to say how much was his life. Side effects from the treatment? No. The primary effect. Keeping a dying host alive as long as possible. That is the whole point. But in the end, he grew too dependent on his children. Hmm. As if he had any other way to keep on living. He first underwent parasite therapy before the Soviet Union became his home. His body was horribly burned. Fire washed across his thin young frame and stole his skin and his throat, even his lungs. Only through repeated therapies could the parasites keep him alive. Most of his life became something the parasites gave to him. And then he lost the ability to die. 
That is correct. The parasites live on past the host's death, still aiding cell composition. At that stage, there is no way to extract them from the host cells. There is no way of knowing when the last cell of Skullface's body would die. The only choice was to burn the whole thing. And his children, along with it. <laughs> and I am one to talk. When my life is snuffed out, I expect you to treat my body the same way. And when I burn, I will truly be one with my children for the first time. You say there were three English vocal parasites. According to Skullface, yeah. Skullface had two of the English strain with him. You burned both of them. There was an oil fire. I tossed him in. So that just leaves one. And you tell me Skullface said he used it. He said it was very close to me. Very close. One of your comrades. Or someone ordered to kill you. Or he could have been speaking metaphorically. Mm. Metaphorically? Close to your spirit. Close to your heart. Someone who either loves you or despises you. The second one makes a long list. Whichever it is, act with caution. Skullface implanted someone with the English language strain. Who it is is irrelevant. Why? I tell you what Skullface really meant. Very close to you means you will be exposed. Mm. All the infected here have been given the Wolbachia. Even if the vocal cord parasites infect them now, they cannot reproduce. But if there is a different host among us, host to the English strain... If that were the case, we'd see the symptoms. What about the non-English speakers? We have plenty of those, but the staff use English as a common language. But if that someone has not spoken English yet, and begins to speak it now, there'd be another outbreak. The final mating pair of the English strain must be found immediately. Skullface is gone, but his threat still remains on this base. Do you see what the final mating pair is? With him dead, those parasites are the stain he wished to leave upon the world. His thirst for vengeance in the flesh. Think. Does anyone here bear a grudge against you? Who would target you specifically? The ethnic cleansers that Code Talker mentioned, they were in Skullface's true goal. All we have is circumstantial evidence, but here's my theory. It was Cypher who started developing the vocal cord parasites as bioweapons, parasitic weapons, and Africa was the testing ground for them. As Code Talker said, their purpose is the ethnic cleansing of only those who speak a particular language. So they could do a weapon of mass destruction to eradicate specific groups, races, ethnicities, or colonies by the language they speak or a kind of absolute language control. Or maybe a tool for those arrogant fools to build some misguided utopia. I can see plenty of uses for them. However, in practical terms, they wouldn't be as dangerous as you think. Counteracting the parasites is easy, after all. Cut them out of your throat to save your life, or just don't talk. That also prevents the infection from spreading. So if the international community were to find out about them, they'd no longer be the threat they were conceived to be. In which case, their targets would be limited to minority groups as a deterrent or a terrorist tool. Oh, it's job. hard to imagine Cypher developing something like that as a main weapon for their arsenal. That leads me to think we've only tugged on one little thread in Cypher's grand tapestry. An obscure corner of their work, possibly forgotten altogether. In any case, things changed. When Skullface was forced to relocate to Africa and he saw that thread dangling. All the time he continued that research, he was secretly following his own agenda. The ethnic liberator parasites. 
is English language strain. Skullface said there were only three samples of the English language strain parasite, and I think we can believe him. Bringing his ethnic liberators plan to fruition depended on creating an English version of the vocal cord parasites at all costs. But an English strain would have been useless to Cypher. Worse, it could have destroyed everything they'd built. It was the one type they couldn't allow. That means Skullface was forced to develop his English strain out of sight of Cypher's network. Naturally, he couldn't use the greenhouse facility Cypher had set up and filled with guinea pigs. Skullface must have found some secret place to create his precious few English parasites, hiding all evidence like a man cheating on his wife. Somewhere, an entirely standalone environment. And when his plan entered its final phase, he must have made the place disappear. Some little room could be anywhere, but now nowhere at all. We'll never know where he did it, but to elude Cypher's surveillance, it couldn't have been big. I believe Skullface was telling the truth. There were only ever three samples of the English language strain. Why activate Sahelanthropus in Afghanistan? This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Sahelanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Sahelanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory, never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something, quietly, beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready, too. So back a few tapes ago, they were talking about who hasn't said anything yet and to watch the people that actually start speaking English there's only two people that come to mind obviously is uh quiet and then Eli because Eli hasn't said a damn word to us at all okay so 